pray together. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, thank you that you are God with us, that you are Emmanuel, that you seek so much to be with a rebellious and wayward people that you would send your son to die for us. And Lord, I pray that as we open up your word, as we talk about uh, the shepherds, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to see in our own lives the ways in which you have shepherded us to bring us here today to hear your message, that our lives may be changed. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Travis, and I'm one of the pastors here. I love getting to be one of the pastors here. It's a great, great job uh, because there are great people to work with. Um, you know, they're just fantastic, fantastic people. I feel like that didn't sound super believable. I really mean it. I really mean that they're great people to work with. Um, one of the best things about just working in a church is you, you get to experience, like it's like Christmas. Uh, like when we start planning Christmas, we start thinking about Christmas a lot. So you kind of get a little bit of a longer runway in the ramp up to Christmas, which is good because uh, by the time everybody else is getting into it, those of us who are slower to excitement uh, have a little bit more runway, right? We can just have a little bit more time to engage and it's good. Uh, but one of the things that I have found this year that I really love about Christmas that I'm kind of surprised by because I never really got into it before is Christmas cards. I don't know what it is. They're these little pieces of paper, but I don't know if it's, I think what we started doing in our house is we've started, um, we have like this uh, doorway in our home that Kim is putting the Christmas cards around this doorway. And then I was at a Christmas party on Friday and uh, the people at that home were doing the same thing. Now they're way cooler than we are and they have more Christmas cards than we do. And that's okay. I'm not asking for Christmas cards. I'm just, I'm recognizing that they're cool too. Like game recognizes game, right? So you're like, they are cool people. And so what I think is neat about the Christmas card is that with a Christmas card, it's like this little window into this person's life. And it's either somebody that you kind of know, or it's somebody you know really well, or it's somebody at one point you knew well, and they're like re reminding you like, hey, we still care about you. We still love you. We still think about you. And here's the, you know, twins that we had over the last year, or wow, they had yet another child. Like, oh my gosh. Or look, they're uh, it seems that they've moved or wow, like this was clearly taken on a beach. They had a great vacation. Where was ours? You know, just stuff like that. The jealousy of the Christmas card. It's great. It's fine. <laughs> but they're like these really nice reminders. They're invitations into a snapshot of this person's life and a reminder that people care about you. And that's really what we want at Christmas, right? Like, the gifts, and, and we, we want to be invited. We want to be included into somebody's festivities. That's why being alone at Christmas is so hard, is because you feel left out. Even the gift exchange, the exchanging of the gifts, when you get a gift for somebody and you don't get one back from them, that can be really difficult because you're like, oh, apparently like I thought differently of you than you think of me. Or you're just one of those people that love giving gifts. And you're just like, oh, gifts for everybody. And you don't care if you get one back. Good for you. I'm more selfish than you. <laughs> and that's okay. But I think one of the things that we miss, because we have heard about Christmas for so very, very long, is that we don't expect necessarily to be included on God's Christmas card list. And I know that sounds cheesy. When I was working through it, I thought, eh, that sounds kind of campy. But I think it's true. Like, I don't think we think about how much, even if the only time, the only time you think about God is during Christmas and maybe Easter, God still sends you a card. He still sends you an invitation. He still wants a relationship with you. He still wants to remind you that I want to talk to you more than just once or twice a year. And that's such a gift. And so what I want us to talk about today as we look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20 is I want us to look at the shepherds, and I want to see how they responded to their unexpected invitation to a birthday party, and then we can see how we can respond to God's unexpected invitation as well. And the first thing is this. We need to get excited. Let's get excited. Look at chapter 2, verse 8. It says, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the peoples. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. Shepherding, despite what David would have us believe about lions and bears and giants, was an incredibly boring job. Your job as a shepherd, and at this point in history, they're not even your flocks. They're, you're hired out. You're a hired hand. Is to sit there. Your job is to watch them eat, watch them sleep, watch them mate, and then bring them back home safely again. It is a boring profession. And what's more is you want boring. It's a lot like being a cop or a firefighter. You don't want an exciting day. You want a boring day. Because if, if, if an exciting day happens for a shepherd, that meant one of the sheep got lost or got eaten or a lot of the sheep got eaten. It's not a good day. And again, remember, these aren't your sheep. You're a hired hand. You're hired out to somebody else. Now, it's possible based on the fact that this is in Bethlehem and it's really close to Jerusalem. It's possible that these were like the temple sheep and maybe these were even priests that were watching the sheep. Regardless, these are not their sheep. And into this monotony comes a whole lot of excitement. Maybe more excitement than anybody really anticipated. This angel shows up and says, I have good news of great joy for all the peoples. You're going to find a baby in Bethlehem, which is a really big deal because that was the city of David. The Messiah was supposed to be born there. And you're going to find him in a manger, which I know things were done differently back then, but babies were not put in feeding troughs then either. And you're going to find him wrapped in swaddling cloths, which was also a sign because babies, royal babies, were not wrapped in swaddling cloths. Royal babies were pampered, and, and swaddling cloths was like a, like a low-income thing to do for your baby. And so what the angel is telling the shepherd is, hey, this baby's one of you guys. You're going to be welcomed. You're going to, these people are your people. You're invited to this party, this unexpected birthday. And don't worry, I know it's a king, but you're going to fit right in. Just go on in. But one of the things that the angel says, and the angel says it to Mary, the angel says it to Joseph, and the angel says it to the shepherds, we talked about it last week, do not be afraid. And I got to wonder, what are these guys afraid of? Now, the, the, the logical thing is to sit there and be like, well, some guy just popped up out of the middle of nowhere, maybe right next to them, maybe in the heavens, and now they're scared of this angelic being. That's fair. Because God appearing to you after God has been silent for 400 years could be terrifying. It could feel like, oh my gosh, he's about to wipe us all out right now. We're totally scared. Or maybe they're afraid that their sheep are just running wild. Because when the angelic host appears, right? Like all of, I can't imagine their sheep were just like, oh, cool. Look at that which would have just sounded like, bah, but it, if you speak sheep, you know what they said. <laughs> and so the, the sheep maybe are just running around and they're thinking, oh my gosh, we're losing our sheep. We're going to lose our jobs, our livelihood. This is it. And the angel says he has good news of great joy. News isn't always good. Even when somebody says that it's good news, it's not always good, right? We hear news all the time. Not a lot of it is good. We live in a very uncertain time. Or maybe they're told there's a king that was born. Political change in that day and age was sometimes, very often, met with violence. We know this is what happens. Herod is growing in age. Herod the Great, who's the king over the area, he's growing in age. And as he is growing in age, most scholars believe that he's struggling with dementia at this point, and dementia and paranoia. He is so paranoid about being assassinated that he has his own heir killed. The man is slowly losing his grip on reality, and he wasn't a nice person before that. 
And so the news of a king for shepherds might have been like, oh my gosh, what is this just going to mean for those of us who have to live under this guy? This may not have been good news. This might have been terrible, fearful news. Don't be afraid carries a lot of weight. We talked about it last week. Some of the same things the shepherds were afraid of, you might be afraid of today. You might be afraid of God's opinion of you. That there is not peace between you and your creator. That you, when I said you get a Christmas card from God, you're like, yeah, but it's got flames on it. God doesn't want anything to do with me. Or maybe you're afraid of news. They live in very uncertain times. I don't know what, what's going to happen. I feel like we've lived in uncertain times since COVID. And even if we've come out of it, we're still trying to figure out what we're doing and what life is like. It's very difficult. Maybe we're afraid of losing our jobs. Maybe you're like, man, I think, I'm, I think my company's just holding on to me through Christmas because they're trying to be nice. But once the new year rolls around, like, maybe there's fear there. Or maybe you're afraid of political change. Or maybe you're afraid of the future. Because these shepherds don't know it, but in about two years, that same Herod the Great is going to find out that he didn't get a chance to kill this baby in the, womb, in, in, in the manger. And he's going to wipe out every male child two years and under. And you better believe that this town is small enough that some of these shepherds, it was their kids that got killed. It was their cousins, their nephews. They probably would lose somebody in that infanticide that would take place. There's lots to be afraid of. You know what the opposite of fear is? You guys are expecting me to say faith. Yes. I did a thesaurus search this week, and I looked up antonyms. There's a lot of different antonyms for fear. Two of the ones they give are peace and joy, which are both listed in this passage. Peace on earth, goodwill to men, and good news of great joy. Good news of great joy. And I think this is one of the things that chokes out the excitement that we have at Christmas is fear. We're afraid to be excited. We're waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? We spend all this money on gifts and we're like, God, no, that credit card's gonna come bill in January. It's just gonna come due. And you can't enjoy it because you're like, I'm trying to figure out all the ways to make sure everybody feels loved and cared for and gets what they want. But at the same time, I'm also trying to figure out how to put food on the table for the other six months of the year until we pay this off. Maybe you know you have to have a procedure. Maybe you know like just... It's different this year. Maybe somebody's not supposed to, that, that's going to be there that's not supposed to be there, or maybe there's somebody that's not there that you want there. It's just different. There's lots of reasons to be afraid at Christmas, and it chokes out our excitement. Now, are we commanded to be excited at Christmas time? I don't know that we are, but I do think we are also the intended recipients of the good news of great joy. Because why? It's for all the peoples. And I did the little hand gesture as a kid. You open the doors of the church and there's all the peoples, right? Like we know that. We count as all of the peoples. God has a message of peace on earth, goodwill to men, good news of great joy. And you're thinking, Travis, look at the news. There's not peace on earth. There's this great U2 song uh, called Peace on Earth. And it's basically him lamenting the fact that peace on earth doesn't seem true. Doesn't seem real. But the message of peace on earth here is that there is a way now between the creator of all things and his created people. There is a pathway forward to peace. There's peace between God and man. You are given the opportunity to embrace peace and joy this time of year. And again, our society sets aside six weeks out of the year to talk about peace and joy. Like they may not believe in it. They might genuinely think it's true. You might think it's a marketing ploy that Target puts up so they can get you to buy some decorations that say peace and joy. And all of that's fair. But here's the thing. They want to believe. We want to believe that there's something magical about this time of year that brings peace and joy. We want to believe it. And so if you're looking for real peace and joy, you've got to go back to the gospel. 
You got to go back to that, that, that field outside of Bethlehem. You got to go with the, the shepherds from their starting point, from hearing the good news, and you got to return to them. We got to recreate that journey spiritually and mentally. You've got to do it. That's why you need six weeks to ramp up for Christmas time. Because you've got to recreate this act. Now, how do we do that? You've got to find a way to make it new. Because a lot of us have heard the story. When I was reading it just now, you're probably like, yeah, we know. And you probably heard it in Linus's voice. And, and like, we've heard this so many times. There's a song that I like at Christmas time. And one of the lines in the song is uh, talking about the gospel story being ancient but never old. And I think that's like the sweet spot of recognizing, yeah, this is an ancient story, but it's not old. It's not tired. It's not worn out. I got to go back to the manger. I got to go with the shepherds. So how do we do this? Well, there's a couple ways we can do this. A couple ways we can rediscover uh, the, the freshness, the excitement of the gospel again, well into uh, maybe having heard it a lot. First, might I suggest some different music? Music is fine. It's good. Maybe less Jingle Bell Rock, less rocking around the Christmas tree. Anything with rock in it. <laughs> if you've got to say it's rock, it's not rock. <laughs> Talking to you, Elton John, with crocodile rock, right? Like, you just don't need it. What about, and I'll pick on some hymns too. What, what is three ships? What is that? I looked up the lyrics because I care deeply for you and I research my sermons. And I looked up the lyrics, and because I, I was trying to figure out who's on the ships. I assume it's the wise men, but it's not, because on the ships are, and I quote, Christ and his lady. That's a quote, an actual line from the song. Where are the ships going? Is it the Nina Pinta Santa Maria? I don't know. The nearest, here's what I do know. I do know geography. The nearest body of water to Bethlehem is 20 miles away. By the way, that's the Dead Sea. Not a lot floating there, or there's a lot floating there. You don't need it. We can have less of three ships. It's fine if you like the tune. It's not a bad song. But I'm just like, what are we doing? We need fresh songs, songs that remind us of the gospel. What does the psalmist tell us to do? Multiple times, by the way. Sing a new song unto the Lord. Keep your old ones. Great. Great. But sing a new song. Here's some recommendations, some that I really love. Um, Andrew Peterson, who I've talked about before, is a great uh, kind of folksy Christian artist uh, out of Nashville. He sings, uh, he has a whole album called Behold the Lamb of God. And he walks with you in 45 minutes from Genesis all the way up through the Old Testament and into the birth of Jesus. And it is fantastic. He even does a tour every Christmas year, uh, season uh, with the artist that he does the songs with. And it's incredible. If you've ever get a chance to go see Behold the Lamb of God, one day I promise we will have it here because I love it that much. Um, and my wife will, will love me for it too. Uh, Josh Garrels is another great uh, musician. He has a song, uh, an album called The Light Came Down. Uh, he's the one that also said ancient but never old. Sandra McCracken of Cademan Call's fame, or Cademan, Cademan's Call fame, uh, has an album called Christmas, which is really on the nose, but it's fit, still very, very good as far as an album go. And again, I reference all of these not to make you listen to what I listen to. You will be blessed because of it. But what I'm doing is we need to explore new opportunities and new songs. Just breathe some new life in there. What about art? For 2,000 years, we have been thinking about the birth of Jesus. For 2,000 years. And long before we got the chosen or the greatest story ever told, people have been trying to depict what that night was like in different art forms, in different media, mosaics, oil, watercolor. A quick Google search, and you will find some of those beautiful pieces of art. I would encourage you, as you're using the Advent Guide and as you're walking through your quiet time, just use your phone and do a Google search of a different image. And just contemplate it for a while. Start with this one. I asked a uh, church history, uh, person with a church history degree, uh, what, I, what I should recommend, because I don't know. And they said uh, Rembrandt's uh, Nativity is like the best. And it's like widely regarded as one of the best. But like Michelangelo and Raphael and the other Ninja Turtles, they've all painted something. <laughs> and we deserve to see it. So that's one thing you can do. I recommended the Advent Guide. There's poetry in there, which again, I'm not a poetry guy, I'm gonna be honest. But 
It is an excellent way to engage a story that you're familiar with by thinking about it in a new sort of rather prosaic way, a, a poetry way. So I would encourage you to look at that. And then lastly, this is something I've been doing. I've been walking through the book of Hebrews. And if you don't know much about the book of Hebrews, basically the whole message is Jesus is better. So he is the better, he's better than angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than priests. The new covenant's better than the old covenant. Jesus is way better. And so what I've tried to do in my own life recently is anytime I get excited about something, and I get excited about a lot, namely food, I like food. Diet Coke is another one I get excited about. Uh, this week, uh, I had a Tuesday evening where I, was, I had free. It was nothing was going on, and I was super excited about that. And what I'm trying to train myself to do is this one-sentence liturgy, which is, yeah, that's really good, but Jesus is better. That's really exciting. That's going to be so delicious. But Jesus tastes better than that. Jesus is going to be sweeter than that. Jesus is better than that. And it's helped. It's really helped kind of not diminish the excitement, but really put into the right place where that excitement should be. So I would encourage you uh, to do that. Join me with that of just Jesus is better. And I've let that kind of fuel on my, my time with him uh, this, this Christmas season. So we get excited, but we don't just stop there. We got to get moving. We got to start moving. Look at verse 15 of chapter tw uh, 2. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So the shepherds don't just say cool and go back to work. I feel like that's something we would do in our modern day. We'd be like, well, I need to finish these reports. I would really love to clear off my desk before I took, you know, the, uh, an early lunch and go and see this baby. Um, you know, the market closes at such and such, and we just can't really leave our desk. But these shepherds, they leave with haste. And I imagine them sweeping the village. Again, Bethlehem's not a big place, but all the angel tells them is to look for a baby in a manger. So they've got to like look in people's houses. And I imagine them like knocking on doors and being like, hey, y'all got a baby in there? We're looking for one in a manger. Oh, funny you should say that. Here's one. You know, like I just feel like, the, and, and people would have gone with them. They'd be like, why are you looking for this? Well, it's a long story, but basically an angel appeared to us. And oh, cool, we want to look with you. And so like they probably like picked up people with them because the t by the time they tell Mary and Joseph what had happened, there's a crowd there because Mary treasures things in her heart, but everybody else like thinks it's just crazy. They're like, oh, that's amazing, right? And when they get to Mary and Joseph, like I said, they tell them what they saw. They relate the story to them. They say, this is what we experienced. This is what we've seen. And then once they're done, they go right back to their lives such as they were. But I bet you nothing was ever the same. I bet the next night they were sitting there like, dude, like this time last night. We were just minding our own business, and boom, there was an angel. Or maybe, maybe the next year, they were like, hey, remember this time last year, that angel showed up, and there was the people, the, the other angels? Or maybe they were like, you know what? It was a night just like this, just like this, real quiet. And I bet you there were, were shepherds, maybe the grandchildren of the grandchildren of the grandchildren, who would brag to their coworkers, hey, you know what, my dad was one of the shepherds that was here that night. My mom had just brought him some, some stuff from the house to keep him warm because it was cool and just kind of go through. I want to dive into this a little bit more. I want to think about the shepherds because when they hear from God, they do something. It changes them. It changes them. They don't sit on their hands. They don't wait. There's some kind of a response, a physical embodied response to what God says to do. The angelic message deserves a response. And we live in a culture now where it's such a wait and see culture, right? Like we hear on the news and we're like, well, let's wait and see what happens. Let's see what, God, what, 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 our, what our government's gonna do to respond to that. Let's see how the stock goes up or down to that. Or, well, you know, we need to make some decisions about our employees, but let's wait, let's wait on that, let's see. We even do it a little jaded. We get a little jaded, even when we get like good news, right? You get an announcement from like a cousin who's getting married and you're like, you know, the family doesn't really like the person they're marrying. And you're like, yeah, let's see how long that lasts. 
Like rather, uh, don't act like I'm the only one that does it. I know, <laughs> I know, I live amongst people like me. But even with good news, we're like, well, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. And there's a place for contemplation when you hear from God. Absolutely. We talked about that last week. If you want to catch up, you can go listen to it last week. We talked about how important contemplation is when God speaks, of course. But even when Mary's contemplating, she's not like, hold on, Jesus, I know you're hungry right now, but I'm not going to feed you because I'm still thinking about whether or not God wants me to. No. There's this ongoing obedience, right? Ongoing walking with the Lord. They got to get moving. We got to get moving. You know why the shepherds get moving? It's because this was a once in a lifetime invitation. They were never going to get invited to another king's birthday, ever. Certainly not a Messiah's birthday. This is it. Now, I don't know about you. I don't get invited to a lot of Christmas parties. That's okay. I'm an introvert. It's great. But maybe you do. And you probably have to turn some down. You're like, God, we just can't go to so many. We can't do so many. So you're going to have to pick and choose. But if you got an invitation from like Buckingham Palace... That was like, you are cordially invited to, the, I'm not going to do the accent, but if you're cordially invited to like come and celebrate Christmas at Buckingham Palace, all expenses paid, you would go, right? I mean, I think most of us would go. It's an experience. It's a once in a lifetime chance to celebrate Christmas with the king and his family. Neat. Cool. I, I would have rather hung out with the queen, but still. <laughs> The shepherds receive this unexpected invitation, and the only people who think that they don't deserve to be there are the shepherds. If I showed you a nativity scene, and I didn't have shepherds included, you'd be like, where are your shepherds? The shepherds are the only ones that think, ah, we don't belong here. You know why I think, and this is just a side note, this is just me kind of rambling on, you know why I think the shepherds get, get invited by God? He's inviting his coworkers. God's a shepherd too. He's like, oh, they're in a related field. This is what I do. I shepherd my creation. I guide them. I care for things that can't take care of themselves. I care for people who can't take care of themselves. That's what shepherds do. And so if my son's going to be born, I'm going to invite my coworkers to come and celebrate with me. And you see it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, shepherds, Abel, shepherd, King David, shepherd. After King David, every king is referred to as a shepherd of God's people. Jesus is the good shepherd. If you are working in a field, and again, this is a total side note, but if you work in a field where you are responsible for the well-being of even one other person, you are in a related field to God. If you're a CEO, you are a shepherd. That is your job title. Change it on your business card. You're not a CEO anymore. You're a shepherd. If you're a doctor, you're a shepherd. If you're a nurse, you're a shepherd. If you're a teacher, you got little lambs, you're a shepherd. God loves shepherds. And that's why they get invited to Christmas. That's why they, we are invited as well, because God wants us to join him in the shepherding of people. But this also tells us why we don't get moving when God invites us. And this is going to be hard to hear. We don't get invited, or we don't get excited, and we don't get moving when God speaks to us. Because we think we deserve the invitation. We think we're entitled to the invitation. We think we're entitled to it. We don't have the same response that the shepherds did because we don't grasp it as an unexpected invitation anymore. We think, oh yeah, this is just another Christmas card from God. I get one about this time every year. It's fine because I go to Christmas and I go to Easter and it's fine and I hear about this and then I can go back to doing what I want to do. We think we deserve Jesus. We think we deserve him because he's just another present up under the tree. And what we do, and again, I'm going to step on toes. What we do is before we have our piranha-based feeding frenzy of presents and food, we say, okay, hold up, everybody. We got to read the 20 verses of the Christmas story. Now we've sanctified our materialism. Let's dive in. And it's just opening the Bible at Christmas time is just opening up another gift. Thanks, Jesus. Cool. It's like the ornament you get from your grandmother. Thanks, grandma. Now where's that iPad you got me? You know I'm right. We sanctify or we attempt to sanctify with oftentimes just lip service. The things we really get excited about Christmas. Because what we've done is we flipped the invitation. The unexpected invitation does not come from Jesus to us. We give it to him. We think he should be like, oh, wow, I got a Christmas card from so-and-so. I didn't even know they thought about me anymore. 
Apparently, they only think about me at Christmas. Make Jesus the object of our unexpected invitation. It's even in our language. How many of you came to Christ? Please don't raise your hand. How many of you came to Christ by inviting Jesus into your heart? We use it in our language. The fact that Jesus responds to us, not the other way around. We've become passive in our relationship with Christ. We sit around and wait for him to do something. You know what happens? Because we don't actively wait. We don't wait in prayer. We don't wait in fasting. We don't wait in the word. We just wait. And you know what happens when you sit around and do nothing? You get sluggish. I'm approaching 40. Getting out of the bed is harder. It shouldn't be this hard, y'all. It's just the bed. But you stay still for just a, a few hours. And you got to like limber up before you even let your feet hit the ground. Spiritually, that's where many of us are. You haven't moved in a long time. You're sluggish. And you're slow. And can I be honest with you about something? We got to get moving. You got to get up. You got to respond to what he's doing. You got to train yourself to do this. And it doesn't have to be new stuff. The church has been responding to the gospel message for 2,000 years. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. One of the ways you can respond is by serving. Jesus came to sacrifice himself, so we sacrifice ourselves. That's what Amin was talking about. How about serving, sacrificing? If you don't have a place to serve, that's your first step. Getting plugged in if you're a believer and you're talking about what God is doing. Secondly, you need to open your mouth. Talk about what God is doing. It's one of the things I loved about the Ashton story from last week. They go to this terrible fire. They lose everything they have. And they are pumped because guess what? It's now this platform for them to talk about what God does in their life. Because everybody wants to talk about a fire. Thirdly, confession. God, confession's a big one. Because all of us are sluggish, right? All of us have had moments, times, seasons where we think everything is better than Jesus. And so we actually pursue things other than Jesus. And so confession winds up being this really big part of our relationship with God that we think he doesn't want to do. We think he doesn't want to hear from us about how we failed. And he's like, no, I do so that I can remind you that you're still on the Christmas card list. So I can still remind you that you're invited to dinner, that you're invited to dinner every single time. I'm reading this book by John Owen. He's this uh, 16, 1700s Puritan minister. It's called Temptation and Sin. And his most famous quote from the book is, be killing sin or sin will be killing you, which is great for t-shirts. Um, and it's just a great pithy quote. But one of the things he says in the, in the book is, and, and we're familiar with this expression more of hate the sinner, uh, or sorry, whoops, hate the sin, love the sinner. Yeah, right. I'm always going to get that wrong. I knew it. That's the clip. Hate the sin, love the sinner. That's the way we often say it, right? We're like, oh, I don't like what they do. But what Owen would say, and he says it way more complicated than I'm about to say it, is yes, hate the sin in your life, in your own life, but love Christ. And that's why so many of us still have these persistent sins that lay at the root of our relationship with Christ that kind of haunt us and dog us. It's because we don't love Christ more than we love the things that get in the way of that. And so we have to cultivate that affection for Christ. We've got to overwhelm. It's not just enough to hate what you do that's wrong. You've got to love the one who can rescue you from it. And confession is a big part of that. I'm going to close with a parable that Jesus tells. And it's from uh, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And he says, but he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who'd been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought a five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my 
banquet. What happens here is these three people, these three invitees, which apparently it's more than them, they get excited about other things than this invitation from the master who is God. They get excited about that. They're excited about a business opportunity. They got the yoke of oxygen, o- oxygen, oxen. I'm going to start referring to oxygen as a yoke. They've got a new field. They own something. They've got a new possession. They're in a new relationship, and it's really exciting, and they're not going to go. They get more excited about everything else going on. I'm going to tell you something. We miss out on a lot of things in our relationship with Christ because we're just like those people who received an invitation. And we're like, ah, Jesus, I know. You'll send me another one. I'll just wait. I've got other things going on right now. I've got other things I want to do right now. And it leads to sluggishness and a slack relationship with God. Can I tell you something? That's been my year this year. I feel like my relationship with the Lord has been two steps back, one step forward, sometimes one step sideways, which I don't know how that works, but it just feels very sluggish and slow. I felt like I started the year off really well, and I just feel like it tanked and has just been a slog. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus came for people who are sluggish. He came for people who are slack. Because guess what? Just like grandma sends you a Christmas card every single year, Jesus sends you a card every single year as well saying, I still haven't forgotten about you. I still love you. You're still invited. And what's more is I want your house. I want your walls, not just your doorway to be filled with a notice from me once a year. I want your life to be papered with communication from me to you. Get excited, people. Because your God cares enough about you that even when you are not holding up your end of the relationship, which is always, he still loves you. And the reason why you know this is because Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. He is the means to peace with God. And therefore, he's the only invitation you need to be invited again and again and again get excited because the king has come and then get moving. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you so much for the invitation that is your son. Thank you that rather than nailing it to a wall, you nailed him to a cross to pay for all the times I ignored you, all the times I thought other invitations were better in all the ways that we have been slack and sluggish and openly rebellious. Lord, you have covered that all up with Christ. I pray that we would get excited about that. I pray that you would make that news good to those ears who are tired of hearing it, who have grown weary of hearing it, who have turned a deaf ear to it. Open our ears and our heart. It's in your son's name we pray.